Good morning, I'm Diane Macedo. Thanks for streaming with us. In today's update, President Biden and the leaders of the other six most powerful democracies in the world are meeting today in England for the G7 summit. The group is committing to donating one billion COVID vaccine shots to poorer nations and announcing plans for a 15% global corporate tax. We have the latest from Cornwall in a moment. And ABC News has confirmed a New York Times report that the Trump Justice Department secretly seized communications data from two House Democrats in a hunt for leaks. The DOJ secretly subpoenaed Apple for that data on Congressman Adam Schiff and Eric Swalwell, both vocal critics of President Trump. Apple turned over metadata, but no emails or photos. The Justice Department also secured a gag order on Apple, meaning the congressman didn't know about any of this until recently. Now they're calling for an investigation by the inspector general. And two people have now tested positive for COVID-19 on a celebrity cruise ship that required vaccinations. The Celebrity Millennium was first the first ship to set sail from North America since 2020, and it's still at sea. Celebrity says all close contacts to those passengers have tested negative, and all crew members were also vaccinated. Doctors tell us breakthrough cases are rare, but they do happen. Meanwhile, the nation's still chipping away at the president's goal of having at least 70% of adults vaccinated by July 4th. 13 states have already crossed that threshold, and at least 64% of adults have received at least one shot so far. The Senate has confirmed the first Muslim American federal judge in U.S. history. Zahid Qurashi was confirmed by an overwhelmingly bipartisan vote of 81 to 16. The son of Pakistani immigrants, he was raised in New Jersey and enlisted in the military after the 9-11 terror attacks. And as we mentioned, the G7... G7 summit, I should say, is now underway in Carbis Bay, a seaside town in Cornwall, England. President Biden joined UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson and the leaders of France, Germany, Italy, Canada, and Japan for that traditional so-called family photo before getting down to business. Congressional correspondent Rachel Scott joins us live from Cornwall with the latest on the summit. Rachel, what are some of the big issues on the table this time around, and what kind of challenges do you think Biden could face here? Well, this is the first time, Diane, that all of these world leaders are, are gathering amid a global pandemic. They have not seen each other. Our president has not stepped foot on foreign soil in more than 450 days. So certainly a lot to discuss here, everything ranging from climate change to the pandemic, to getting more vaccines to other countries that need them, and also discussing some of the cyber attacks that the United States believes that Russia is behind. So that is going to be a clear point of focus at the G7 summit. Uh, that is happening right now, but also some of the challenges that we're going to see the president face is really convincing these allies that America is back. This is the message that the president is bringing to our allies, but they have been through whiplash over the last several years. Former President Donald Trump, he pulled the United States from the Paris Climate Accord. He threatened to uh, leave NATO, calling it obsolete. And so now President Biden is going to have to convince these allies that this time is going to be different. He's also bringing a message that democracy democracy works. But I could tell you that those images of the insurrection at the Capitol on January 6 made its way across the world. So he's going to have to convince these leaders also that it's working back home as well, Diane. And Rachel, the leaders have agreed to this 15 percent global tax on corporations. How will that work and what are they trying to accomplish with that? This is something that the president and the White House have been pushing for, so they are pretty pleased by this uh, being, uh, that, that, that this is actually pushing through here. This is something that they've been pushing for as they're trying to pay for their larger domestic agenda uh, back home. So this is going to make it so that companies pay the same tax rate regardless of where their headquarters are. So this will prevent companies from paying a little bit less if they decide to have their headquarters in a different part of the world, something that is important, the United States says. Uh, but it still has a little bit of ways to go here. What they are hoping is that by getting this agreement here at the G7 that this is now going to be a springboard leading into the G20 and that other countries will have to come on board. But every government, including right back home in Congress, they're going to have to approve this first before it actually goes into effect. All right. And Biden set to meet the queen later this weekend. Rachel, what kind of a role mm -hmm. will she and the rest of the royal family play in terms of being on the sidelines of this summit? 
Yeah, well, Biden will become the 13th president to meet with the queen, all the way back to 1951, when actually the queen was actually a princess. She traveled to the White House and met Truman at the time and said that uh, the world looks to the United States for hope and for democracy. And regardless of politics, we talked about the whiplash that many of our allies have experienced over the last several years, over the last several decades, rather. Uh, the queen has been sort of a stable figure. She has met with all of our leaders uh, of our country. And so once again, we're going to see this happen today. They're going to be holding a reception, the queen inviting some of these world leaders uh, over, and they'll be meeting face to face. Meeting 13 U.S. presidents face to face. Pretty incredible. And Rachel, all of these events lead up to Biden's summit with Vladimir Putin next week. How do you think yeah. these meetings that he's having now could influence how he handles that meeting next week? Yeah, well, the White House has said that they believe that the President Biden is going to be heading into this meeting with President Putin uh, with the wind at his back. And that's another core focus of the G7 summit is making sure that all of the allies are communicating with one voice against Russia. Uh, this is going to be a very blunt meeting. It's definitely a high stakes meeting. I think the expectations, though, are rather low. Uh, they want to go into this with discussion uh, and defense. And President Biden has made it clear that he wants a stable but predictable relationship relationship with Russia and with President Putin, but it's unclear just what that looks like when, as we know, Russia has been very unpredictable, especially this year. All right, Diane. Rachel Scott, thank you so much, Rachel. And you can watch our full coverage of the Biden-Putin summit next Wednesday, June 16th, right here on ABC News Live. The fiancé of Vanessa Guillen is speaking on national television for the first time since her murder. The 20-year-old Army soldier was killed on a military base after telling her family she'd been sexually harassed by a supervisor. John Quinones has more on her family's search for justice. We want answers. We want justice. Juan Cruz has spent the last year looking for answers after the brutal murder of his fiancée, Army Specialist Vanessa Guillen. Guillen was stationed at Fort Hood in Killeen, Texas, when she disappeared in April 2020, just 20 years old. She was missing for more than two months before her body was found in the woods, 20 miles away. The prime suspect, fellow Army Specialist Aaron Robinson. He died by suicide after escaping the base during the investigation. Now, Guillen's fiancé is speaking out in his first national television interview. Sometimes when I wake up, I'll be like, this is reality. She's no longer here. I'm always thinking about her. Like, it is all the good memories. Cruz describing the moment he learned Vanessa had been found dead. Out of nowhere, all the TVs went red. And he said, breaking news. The remains were Vanessa's Guillens. Yeah. When I seen that, I just started crying. At the time of Guillen's disappearance, her family claimed the army wasn't taking it seriously, leading to protests. <laughs> An investigation into the handling of the Guillen case resulted in the suspension or firing of 21 soldiers. The investigation finding that Guillen was sexually harassed by a supervisor, but that leadership in her unit failed to take action or investigate the allegations. Investigators also saying they did not find any connection between the harassment and her murder, and that poor communication was to blame for allowing the suspect to escape custody. Despite the Army accepting responsibility for many missteps, Cruz says he still wants justice for his beloved. He failed us since the beginning. How can something like that happen on a military base? They taking care of us, protecting us, but who's protecting them? We will hear much more from Vanessa Gann's fiance tonight on 2020, and ABC's John Quinones will be hosting that episode, and John is here live with me now for more on this. John, thanks so much for being here. I know you've been covering Vanessa Gann's story for over a year now. So tell me, what will we learn about her and her case tonight that we haven't already heard?
Well, for the first time, in addition to hearing from her fiancé and her family, we're going to hear from two of her good friends, fellow soldiers, who until now had not said very much. And we will hear what they say Vanessa told them, and that is that she was being sexually harassed by one of her superiors uh, while at Fort Hood. Um, you will also hear new, tale, new details about her killer, uh, the specialist Aaron Robinson. Why, why wasn't he ever arrested, and how did he manage to escape from this militarized uh, base uh, and get a gun and then die by, by suicide? And I'll have some tough questions for the Army itself. We sit down with a major general who helped lead the new investigation into the Vanessa Guillen case. How does he explain all the mistakes and the blunders that the Guillen family says led to this botched investigation? And, John, the Army just finished an investigation into Guillen's case. What were some of their big findings? They did find that she was indeed sexually harassed by one of her superiors, although they will not say who that person is. Uh, but sadly, and perhaps most importantly, they haven't found a motive. They haven't determined why Vanessa was killed. Now, a civilian panel was created to look at the command culture at Fort Hood, and they're the ones with this, the results of this probe. They've discovered that a good number of blunders and mistakes were committed by investigators early on in the investigation. In response, that review board has come up with 70 recommendations, and half of those have already been put in place. Among the most important, a new policy for missing soldiers so that they're not automatically listed as AWOL. The Army will also strengthen its program for reporting sexual assault and sexual harassment. And from now on, a civilian appointee will be in charge of the Army's CID. That criminal investigative command will no longer be overseen by the military. It's a big development. I know Guillen's family has been very critical of the Army's handling of the case. How are they reacting to this new investigation and some of the changes you just said? You know, Diane, the family is still very much beside themselves. They want to know why their daughter was killed and who it was that was indeed sexually harassing them, as I said, her. As I said, the, the military won't tell us. Uh, they say, the family says, the command investigative report has revealed what they already knew more than a year ago. And they're especially upset because the Army had promised them that a high-ranking officer would visit their home and personally explain the findings of their investigation in Spanish to Vanessa's mother, who doesn't speak English. Instead, the results were sent to them by email, and it was revealed to the rest of us, to the media, in a phone conference call. The family expected much more from the Army. And, John, I know you spent a lot of time with her family at this point. The prime suspect in her murder is dead here. So what do you think justice looks like now for Vanessa's loved ones? You know, even if you don't speak Spanish, Diane, uh, when you see tonight's report, you will feel the palpable pain and the void that this family has been left with. Uh, the fiancé, Juan Cruz, dreamed his dreams of marriage, children, a future with, with his beloved Vanessa are gone. And there's a sense that this family, like you said, will never see real justice, because although one woman, Cecily Aguilar, stands accused of helping bury Vanessa's body and she will stand trial soon, the fact is the killer, specialist Aaron Robinson, died by suicide. So they, the family, will very likely never find out exactly what happened to their daughter or why. All right, John Quinone, it's great to have you, John. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. And you can watch the full 2020 special, What Happened to Vanessa, tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern on ABC. And a recent high school graduate got a surprise scholarship at her graduation ceremony, but it's what she did with that money that's making headlines. Feel Good Friday is after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back. It's time for Feel Good Friday, where we bring you a little good news heading into the weekend. And today, it's all about Harvard-bound high school graduate, Verda Teta. Verda received a surprise $40,000 scholarship at her graduation ceremony last week. But it's what she's doing with that money that's making headlines. Take a look. I am so very grateful for this. But I also know that 
I am not the one who needs this the most. And knowing my mom went to community college and how much that was helpful, I would be so very grateful if administration would be um, would consider giving the general um, excellence scholarship to someone who's going to the community college um, because I know it is such a great honor, but I also know that I am not the most in need of it. That's right. She gave all of that money away, and Verda is here now to tell us more about why. Verda, first of all, thanks for being here, and congratulations on graduating. Thank you. Um, so you got this scholarship based on general excellence for outstanding academic achievements. So you clearly earned this. Why did you decide to give it away? Um, I was sitting in the audience and thinking about my amazing community, my amazing peers, and I, I realized that, you know, I, I had been taken care of very well by um, the Harvard financial aid that I got. And someone in, in the audience, like I said, someone sitting next to me maybe, you know, just didn't have that financial aid for college. And I was thinking my mom and the words that my principal were saying, like, be bold and be selfless, things that I, you know, I know and I live by. And that's what I was thinking when I was sitting there. Now, you didn't know you were getting the scholarship until you heard your name called. So how did you make this decision so quickly? Yeah, I think, um, I had reservations about applying before. I, I asked my guidance counselor even, should I apply? Because I knew that, you know, I, I was, you know, right, um, I had financial aid and I, I kind of wanted it to go to someone else to begin with. And she said, apply, you earned it, you deserve it. And if you if you get it, you know, that's great. And if not, that's okay too. Um, so to begin with, I, I didn't know if I should apply, um, but I did. And as after I got it, I was sitting down and my, my assistant principal was speaking. Um, I, I I was thinking about my mom and her journey through community college and having to pay for it. And I I just knew that that was a struggle, um, one that made us all stronger, but of course a struggle nonetheless. And I just knew that it would it would be so beneficial to someone else. And that that's really what made me make that decision. So what was your mom's reaction when first she heard your name called and then she saw your response? Yeah, I think she was really proud of me both times. Um, she was so excited. She didn't know, just like I didn't know. She was so excited when she found out that I got the scholarship. But then she was also really um, proud of me and really glad that I did the right thing when I went up and I, I gave the scholarship away. Um, and I think that that you know that being proud of me that still stands till today. So, tell me, what are you most looking forward to about Harvard this fall? Um, there's a lot of things I'm looking forward to. Um, the academics, you know, internships, research, the, just life in Boston. But I think I would definitely say um, just being able to actually expand this this act of kindness. Really, I I really hope that maybe I can partner with Harvard University itself to kind of continue this act of kindness and and you know reach out with more scholarships to students who need it. All right. Well, you're setting a great example today. Verda Teta, we appreciate having you. Thank you. And again, congratulations. Thank you. And you can find more feel-good stories at goodmorningamerica.com. That does it for this ABC News Live update. I'm Diane Macedo. Thanks for joining us. And remember, ABC News Live is here for you all day with the latest news, context, and analysis. Stay safe and have a great weekend. This here is part of the Stonewall Bar, because there were three of them, one in each corner and one in the center. I mean, you can tell the prices. It's champagne, a dollar twenty-five. Then there was also another stand we had that had Pat's Blue Ribbon and Rango beer, because those were the beers at the time. I would like to just live simply and be myself, and a lot more like empathy to people who are different.
Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.